I'd like to welcome you to this Bible study based on the book, How to Control Your Emotions by Dr. Lee Turner. We've been looking at various topics related to our emotional challenges, but all from what we hope is a Christ-centered, grace-oriented perspective. Tonight, we look at the topic of uh, the phobia of fear, the fear factor. Um, and we're gonna look at a PowerPoint in a moment, but as we begin, let me ask you the question, what memory comes to your mind when you think about a frightening episode? Um, I remember as a boy running along a lake, picking up sticks, throwing them in, and uh, I got within a few inches of a stick and realized it was moving. I think it was a big water moccasin or something, and I freaked out and ran. Um, I've had other scary situations. I remember being um, out of town with a, a counselee that started to go into kind of a... Um, paranoia state, and uh, I felt threatened by that. It was kind of scary. Um, but also, um, I've, I've been amazed at how God has given me peace over the years. I left uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil once on a mission trip, and as the plane left, um, the, the pilot announced that we had to circle back to Sao Paulo because there was uh, fuel leaking from, from one of the tanks of the aircraft. And a Portuguese lady sitting next to me, I was uh, very upset and very frightened by the announcement and the possibility of a mechanical failure. And so I just reached over and kind of patted her arm and she grabbed my arm like, like an eagle landing on a branch. And so I think I still have the, the nail prints on my arm, but bless her heart, she was just uh, so frightened and I prayed and, and uh, we did get back safely to the airport. But maybe you remember a time when you were frightened, you know how your adrenaline pumps and how you have that fight or flight kind of dynamic happening. Um, but we're gonna see that although fear is a natural emotion, it can protect us uh, and it's a valid in those contexts, often uh, it can go overboard or be misplaced and can be uh, very, very um, detrimental to us. So I'm gonna ask you to, uh, if you have your study guide, turn to chapter nine with me. And we're going to uh, um, look at a PowerPoint I prepared and uh, let me go to that PowerPoint. I should have had it pulled up, and I know. And um, I had permission from my wife uh, to mention one other episode from our family. Um, Linda's had uh, lifeguard training. She's a better swimmer than I am. Um, we've uh, done a little bit of scuba diving, and, and she, she wanted to join me in a, um, a certification course for scuba. And so um, those of you who may know about that sport know that you go through some classes and then you come to uh, uh, what's called a open water dive where you're supposed to put into practice what you've learned. It's kind of scary because uh, before that you're in a pool, you're kind of in familiar surroundings, um, but then the, um, the open water dive, you're, you're in a, a lake or a quarry or something like that, and uh, you're really testing uh, what's going on. So my wife and I got to the open water dive of our training and uh, we went out to the middle of this quarry with about eight other students. And then the instructor said, we're gonna go down about 25 feet to a platform at the bottom of this quarry. And then we're gonna do some, some of our, our skill testing. Well, Linda went down before I did. I, um, I was helping someone else and she got down to the platform where we were supposed to kind of gather as a group. And uh, there was some kind of decorations to kind of uh, get our attention there on the platform and bless her heart, she kind of tripped over one, fell backwards just before I got to her and she panicked. First time ever had a panic attack. And one of the symbols you learn in scuba diving is the up, <laughs> the up symbol with your thumb and she was going up, <laughs> she wanted out of there. So um, the instructor and I uh, calmed her down and got her to the surface. She said, I'm done. So off to the shore we went. So um, we, uh, after she calmed down, that became one of our family stories about uh, that, that underwater experience where her fear just took over because uh, the equipment shifted, she was, uh, just a lot of new things and lack of, lack of experience underwater uh, in that context. So uh, thankfully, she's safe. And uh, we did swim around uh, later on in the day to get a little more used to the scuba diving. But uh, those of you who have had some experiences like that in sports or whatever know that fear can just uh, override um, your rational mind. It just kind of takes over as it did for her. Linda, like I said, is a great swimmer, but um, that, that's indelibly etched on her memory bank. Um, I remember that there's other kinds of fear that we may talk of, like a nervousness. 
Um, nervousness is more like when you're on edge about something in particular. I remember when I was in high school, I played French horn and our, our um, band was in a competition and uh, there was a French horn solo at the beginning of the piece of music we were going to play. So there's this, um, you know, this concert hall judges because you're judged and, and the band and here I am first chair French horn having two measures. And <laughs> I think I really had the, the band praying that I wouldn't blow it. And it, somehow I got through the, the two or three measures of French horn solo. But maybe you've had that experience uh, of just having the jitters and, and uh, we certainly need grace for those times. Um, and sometimes we have general anxiety and we've, all, we've had a previous study on anxiety as you, as you recall. Uh, that would be chapter five of the study guide. But anxiety or, or worry is more of a generalized concern where fear is more, has more of a specific object, like a fear of flying or uh, um, a fear of, of a wild animal or something like that. So as we go through the study, uh, we're going to start with the definition. And I'm just adding to our study by uh, a definition I pulled off the internet. Fear is a term that describes an emotional response in reaction to something that may be dangerous or threatening. On a day-to-day -day basis, many people experience fear, ranging from nervousness about public speaking to intense phobias. Well, the public speaking one I can identify with, the first time I was in a, in a Christian music group uh, back in, um, I guess, one year after college, uh, we were giving a concert and the, the band director pointed to me and I gave the testimony symbol, and it was my first time giving a testimony, and uh, it was a short one because I forgot to breathe. So um, by God's grace, I <coughs> was asked to eventually give the 10 minute, five or 10 minute gospel message in concert. So by the end of that two year time with the internationals, um, by God's grace, uh, public speaking um, was something that God gave me grace to do. But I remember that first time, talk about fear. I, I forgot to breathe. That was kind of scary. That's a common um, fear that we have until we have more experience. Um, some examples, I've mentioned some from, from my family um, about uh, uh, the episode in sports. Um, I remember when I was um, just before uh, going to that music group, I had a job for a summer for iron workers in Atlanta, Georgia. And because I was so low on the totem pole in terms of my skills, I had the important job of getting the break for all the guys. <laughs> so as we went up on this, uh, this, this skyscraper, it ended up being 32 stories high. Uh, when it came for a mid-morning and mid-afternoon break, uh, the crane operator would hook the cable up to a cage and I'd step in and have an automatic elevator on the outside of the building where he lowered me down to the ground so we could get our break before everybody else when the, the refreshment truck pulled up. So I, I'd get the crew's uh, refreshments, get in, wave to the fellow and zip up I would go. Today, I'd probably be terrified, but back then I got used to it. Um, but you can remember times when you've had fear, um, whether it was exaggerated or appropriate, and we know it's such a strong emotion, there is a valid role of fear. Uh, like, like we said, it's a protective mechanism for us, right? Um, when we get to a busy intersection, we look both ways. We know uh, that, that crossing a, a street is, is dangerous. Um, Lynn and I were in traffic in Knoxville today um, in a busy expressway, and we had to be on our toes. It was uh, um, highway traffic can be dangerous, so there's a valid role for fear. Our author mentions Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Remember that verse where it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So we have a, a sense of awe, a sense of serious mindedness when we grow in our Christian faith to validate it and to please the true and living God. But verse 13 puts in a grace perspective. It is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So we just need a balanced view of fear, not to see it as bad, not to see it as a uh, as something that's invalid, but rather to put it in context, right? So here we have the believer's confidence. And I'm so glad that the author continually reminds us of the Christ-centered life. Second Peter 1, that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the two, true knowledge of him who called us by his glorious virtue. And uh, we have these precious promises. Romans 5, 10, 
the saving life of Christ is promised to us. And that, that includes being delivered from inappropriate fear. So aren't you glad, friends, that we have that confidence? Psalm 27, verse 1 was not in our chapter, but it's one of my favorites. Psalm 27 begins, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So as we consider the definition of fear, we move on to the causes of fear. You'll notice that our author brings us back to the fall, to Genesis chapter 3. Because when God created everything in Genesis 1, he said, it is good. And we see that God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and met all their ultimate needs. And uh, what a beautiful picture we have of, of the Garden of Eden in chapter 2 of Genesis. But as you know, God warned Adam uh, to not eat of the forbidden fruit out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That would represent breaking fellowship with God, being independent from God, um, breaking that, that uh, covenant of innocence in Eden. And tragically, Eve was deceived. Adam broke that covenant and plunged the human race into, into uh, a state where we are vulnerable to fear. For example, before the fall, there was no um, uh, fear of animals. Uh, there was no curse. Um, Adam had dominion over the animals. He named them. And uh, it would be like a big petting zoo where all the animals were in harmony. You may recall from our chapter, Romans chapter 8, verses 20 and 22, that because of Adam's sin, there was a curse placed on creation, and the whole creation groans, as it were, in the pains of childbirth until God's kingdom is revealed in the future. So that curse uh, was mentioned in Genesis 3, that by the sweat of Adam's brow, he would till the ground, it would bear thorns and thistles, and uh, there was this curse placed on now animosity between um, many of the animals and, and humankind and things like that. We have, we have natural disasters, earthquakes, and so forth. And these are all, all um, the, uh, the tragic consequences, the cosmic consequences of the fall. So the reason you and I have detrimental fear and exaggerated fear is because we live in a fallen world. Now, there are specific fears. And um, I think one that I'd like for us to look at, if you have your Bible nearby, is Hebrews chapter 2. It's mentioned, uh, as you know, this, this could be a couple of lessons, right? But in Hebrews chapter 2, we have this reference about the fear of death and how, how restricting that can be and how it can rob us of peace. So in Hebrews chapter 2, um, talks about the mission of our Lord Jesus, and it says this <coughs> in verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, verse 15, and release those through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Saying here that, that the fear of death brings bondage, brings restriction, being, brings burdens, robs us of joy. But aren't you glad, friends, that our Lord Jesus comes as our hero, as our redeemer, and through death, he conquered, um, and he uh, rose victorious over the grave. I love uh, how our author quoted Revelation chapter 1, where we have the glorious declaration of our risen Savior, where he talks about being the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet, and everything in between. Revelation 1, verse 17 is quoted in our text, where our Lord says, Do not be afraid. So once again, he's putting fear you know, in place. I am the first and the last. The risen Christ is speaking. I'm the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So our Lord has, has the keys and he's unlocked um, that, uh, um, that frightening door of death so that you and I have eternal life through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and God's redemption. And so uh, friends, if if we have been troubled by the fear of death, we need to remember that for the believer, death is going to sleep on this side and waking up on the other side. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And as 1 Corinthians 15 has said in this rhetorical question, death, where is your sting? A grave, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we've been bothered by the fear of death, look unto Jesus, friends. Look to the empty tomb and know that the risen Christ lives in you by his Holy Spirit. 
We also have fear of illness. We've had a couple of prayer requests during this Bible study of, of um, our relatives that are dealing with uh, hospitalization even today. So uh, it is a legitimate concern. But once again, um, we want it to be enough of a fear for us to take appropriate uh, measures in terms of natural health principles, nutrition, rest, exercise, and so forth. And but also we don't want it to be a, a phobia and excessive paranoia, which robs us of freedom. So again, we need that balance. The Apostle John prayed that we would prosper and be in good health, even as our soul prospers. In the fear of old age, um, I wrote a grace note recently about uh, how to age gracefully. <laughs> I, I did it mostly for myself, wanting to learn that lesson. Um, and getting my Medicare card last year was a pretty sobering experience. But the fear of old age, uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.7, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So whatever our age, God has given us that confidence to face life's challenges, uh, not with a spirit of fear, but with power, love, and a sound mind, or another translation is self-discipline. We say, Paul, were you able to maintain that even to the end? Well, this is the last letter Paul wrote. This is from his second Roman imprisonment, and he was martyred shortly after this. But we see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, where he bids farewell to his, his beloved son of the faith, Timothy, that he has run the race with confidence. So reading from chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. He describes death as departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, not only to me only, but also to those who have loved his appearing. So praise God for his grace that is sufficient to overcome the fear of death, of illness, of old age, and other specific fears that are detrimental in our lives. Aren't you glad for this consolation, friends, that through our spiritual union with Christ, we can have confidence. We can put fear in his proper context. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, the one who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And because of that, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And that gives us dignity to know that the true and living God lives within us, makes a tremendous difference when it comes to facing our fears. Uh, we see in chapter nine of of our study guide that uh, Matthew chapter 14 is not only um, a meaningful account uh, of our Lord praying on the mountain, walking on the water and so forth, but it's going to become an illustration that spreads through most of our chapter. And uh, Lee Turner mentions that in this passage, our Lord has fed the 5,000, dismisses the multitude, has the disciples depart in a boat across to start to go across the um, uh, the Sea of Galilee, that big freshwater lake, uh, 12 miles, miles across, <clears throat> whereas he goes up on a mountaintop to pray. So here we have not only a literal narrative, friends, but we also have kind of a, an illustration where Jesus is on the mountain, the disciples are on the lake, a big storm comes, and they're, they're afraid that they may, they may go down. And that's not only a literal um, account in the Gospels, it also reminds us that during this whole church age, including uh, the time we're living in, you might say our Lord is up high. Now, of course, he's ascended to heaven, and he is praying for us, but we're down on the lake. We're down here in the nitty-gritty of life in this fallen world. We may not be in a lake, you know, with the storm, literally, but we're, we probably have some storms in our life, don't we? And so just as the disciples were struggling on the lake dark, windy, storm, tossed, feeling alone. So we can feel that way too, right? And so we're going to be looking at this uh, several times as we go through uh, this chapter to see that even though Jesus is not immediately with them, he's praying for them, he's, he's aware of their trial, and he's going to intervene. And so he cares about us, is praying for us, and uh, will be faithful to walk with us as well. As we continue on in our study, friends, we see that there are consequences of fear. When fear comes, um, we see it's a, a very strong emotion. There are psychological effects. And sometimes those psychological effects can be really harmful or negative, disturbing. They can cause a lot of confusion and inner conflict. 
Although because there are also some psychosomatic or, or uh, soul body interaction effects, um, sometimes uh, people actually enjoy that. We have extreme sports. We have here in our tourist town in Tennessee, people who do bungee jumping, which you know is kind of an intentional form of fear for, for the sake of amusement. People watch horror shows um, and they're, they're intentionally stepping into fear as a way of self-entertainment. But we see that when fear does grip us, then uh, there are a lot of um, physical symptoms that arise because the body is being mobilized for what they call the fight or flight um, situation. So in our study guide, we have a pretty vivid description of how uh, the body has all kinds of, of uh, inner changes that take place. For example, one doctor puts it this way, respiration deepens, the heart beats more rapidly, arterial pressure rises, the blood is shifted from the stomach and intestines to the heart, central nervous system and the muscles. And he goes on and on about how the body is mobilized to, to face this fear that's perceived. So we see that um, there are um, psychological consequences, physical consequences. We have counselees that contact our ministry that's, that say things like, you know, a few months ago, I thought I was having a heart attack. I couldn't breathe. I went to the hospital assuming that it was a uh, a heart attack and they, they ran the tests and they, they would say to them, you know, we can't find anything wrong with your heart. This must be a panic attack. And so for the first time, they're experiencing what is interpreted to them as a panic attack. It's not imaginary, it's real. The physical symptoms are, are real and yet it's triggered by the buildup uh, and intense emotion that triggers the panic attack. So these are, these are things that are happening right across the country and and some watching this Bible study may identify with that firsthand. We see um, the illustration continued in Matthew chapter 14, 26 to 30, where our Lord Jesus starts to walk on the water. And one, another one of his nature miracles that uh, shows his sovereignty over the created realm. And um, here we see in our passage that it reminds us that the Lord is coming to reassure us. Matthew 14, verse 26 we read, on the fourth watch of the night, I think that's about 3 a.m. in the morning, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. They said, it's a ghost. They cried out in fear. Again, we see that fear is, is a natural reaction based upon what a person perceives. Verse 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. So the Lord says, be of good cheer, I am. Our author emphasizes that Jesus is using the phrase, I am. Uh, the Greek words there, ego eimi, means I myself am. It's an intensified way of saying it. And Lee Turner takes us back to Exodus 3, where, where Jehovah says to, to Moses, tell them, I am sent you. I am that I am. And that, that uh, Hebrew verb uh, to be, I am, shows that this is the personal name of God. He is Yahweh. Um, he is the covenant-keeping, personal, living, self-existent God. This is his personal name. We don't know exactly how to pronounce it because we just have the four vowels, uh, We uh, The actual pronunciation has been forgotten because the Jews were so concerned about mispronouncing the name, the name of, of Jehovah. We think it's pronounced Yahweh. Some people will say Jehovah. But the important thing is that he is the I am. And so Jesus says, it is I, do not be afraid. And then Peter says amazingly, Lord, if it's you, invite me to walk on the water to you. And so we might think, uh, yeah, we remember the story. You know, Peter gets distracted. He sinks. Poor Peter. Um, wonder why he, he didn't walk all the way to Jesus successfully. But remember, friends, he's the only one who got out of the boat. So Peter showed quite a bit of faith to walk as far as he did. But we also see in the story that um, that Peter sinks. Why did he start to sink? Because he was distracted by what? By the wind and the waves. And friends, this is an illustration for you and for me that if you and I are distracted by the wind and the waves, um, the, the dangers, the distractions, the stresses of our life, in a way that takes our eyes off of our Savior, off of uh, the immediate presence of Christ in our hearts, then we're going to sink into 
anxiety, depression, fear. And we're going to see, though, that our Lord reaches out to rescue Peter, just as he's ready to do for you and me. We also have in our chapter so many scriptures, right? We have the example of Paul's reassurance, where he's almost martyred in Jerusalem in that big riot, and the Lord reassures Paul he's going to testify at Rome. Then chapter 27 of Acts, there's that, that, uh, that horrific uh, storm uh, that blew in, and uh, they thought they were all going to drown, but by God's miraculous intervention, God appears to Paul, and the angel says that God will, will deliver the whole, um, the whole uh, list of passengers that are Paul's traveling companions, and they all made it safely to that little island of Malta where they run aground. So God reassures Paul and uh, demonstrates his faithfulness in, in spite of the dangers and I'm, I'm sure the emotions that went through um, uh, being shipwrecked there in Acts 27, God demonstrated his faithfulness once again, as he will for you and me. Another illustration in our chapter is the story of the 12 spies in Numbers chapter 13 to 14. Uh, the people suggest, you know, let's spy out the land. And so a representative from each of the 12 tribes uh, checks out um, the land of Canaan, the land that God designated to be the promised land. He would simultaneously judge um, the wicked Canaanites. He had given them four centuries to repent, as you may recall, and also give the promised land to his people. And uh, however they come back after that, that trial period, and 10 of the 12 spies say that, no, we, we're, we're like grasshoppers compared to the people of the land. They're walled cities and it can't be done. So the 10 spies gave a negative report and uh how tragic that the people listened to those 10 spies who were who were deceived by their fears whereas joshua and caleb said what they said if i can paraphrase if if our god could deliver us from egypt through the 10 plagues and part of the red sea he can surely fulfill his promise these people are like bread to us their protection has been removed and yet the people did not listen to joshua and caleb um, and so we see all those 20 years of age and older perished during the next 40 years, except for Joshua and Caleb, who eventually did enter the promised land. So friends, let us remember that our confidence is going to, to be a positive testimony to others like Joshua and Caleb's was. On the other hand, inappropriate, excessive fear can be a stumbling block, and we don't want to be a stumbling block. The cure of fear. We're back to our illustration of Matthew 14 where um, our friend Peter is distracted, he starts to sink, and that would be pretty scary, wouldn't it? Um, as he looks at the wind and the waves and gravity takes over, and um, uh, he starts to sink, Matthew 14, verse 31. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of Peter, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So Peter had cried out, Lord, save me. And aren't you glad the Lord just reached out and, and pulled him up just as he will pull up you and me as we trust in him. So uh, another aspect of our narrative as an illustration about overcoming fear, Jesus is with us. Um, Jesus calmed the storm and uh, he will calm the inner storms of our life. Our author takes us to Luke 8 uh, of another storm story where this time, remember, Jesus was so exhausted he was asleep in the stern of the boat, and uh, another storm came upon the Sea of Galilee. It was known for sudden storms due to the geography of the area. The big mountains to the north of the sea would sometimes allow sudden storms to, to descend on the lake, and here's another one of them. And uh, they come to Jesus so alarmed, don't you care, Lord, we're about to drown. And Jesus uh, uh, awakes and goes to the stands up and he rebukes the wind and the waves and there's a great calm and the disciples are shocked they're overwhelmed they're amazed and they say what kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him and so aren't you glad that when our hearts are storm tossed with excessive fear and anxiety and worry that the lord can speak peace to the storms of our heart in spite of the fact that our world and our society and our circumstances could be very much storm tossed he can give us that kind of peace, right? You'll notice that our Lord continues to focus on the role of faith. Where is your faith? And here we see in our chapter that faith and fear do not coexist. One will overrule the other. 
And so Doubting Thomas, remember, said, I'm not going to believe that Christ is risen unless I see with my own eyes the nail prints. Well, the Lord appeared a week later, and he uh, demonstrated his, his resurrection, glorified body uh, to Thomas. But then he said, Thomas, you are, you are believing because you've seen, but blessed rather are those who have not seen yet have believed. And friends, that applies to us in our generation, doesn't it? We are basing our faith on the word of God. We weren't there to see these things as eyewitnesses, but we're taking God at his word. And as we do so, then there's an inner amen as the Holy Spirit reassures us and transforms our life uh, to give a subjective confirmation of our faith. In Matthew 16, our, our Lord is asking, who do people say that I am? And Peter has the right answer. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus reassures him, you have not recognized my identity by human reasoning, but my father revealed it to you. So friends, we have God's revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who is victorious, who is our, um, our Savior, Lord, in life. And therefore, we can have faith that gives us a security and peace, even in the midst of fearful circumstances. I'd like to add one other concept to our very full study, and that is the comfort of God's love. In 1 John chapter 4, uh, we don't want to forget a very meaningful passage about the role of God's love in this theme. And here we read that perfect love casts out fear. See that? So we don't, um, we don't get over fear just by um, being, um, having cognitive therapy or learning new coping mechanisms or turning to medicines. Each of those things may give some temporary benefit, but there's a much greater supernatural solution. Perfect love, to know that God loves us, that he accepts us, that he is faithful to us, that will um, overrule fear. And then it says that we love God because he first loved us. So friends, let's all be encouraged and let the, the reality of God's love be a great source of consolation as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. So often in our study, we have these words of reassurance about how the Christ-centered life is our source of security. For example, this quote under the topic, The Cure of Fear, 2,000 years ago, Dr. Turner says, Jesus died that he might give us life and reign in us. Many who have experienced victory fall back into defeat because they are not walking in the spirit, but trusting self. If we have not entered into the victorious life, it is because it is an entirely new principle of living that is foreign to us. It is not us getting a little more victory over sin. It is Jesus taking over and living his life through us. We must trust him moment by moment, knowing that when we trust ourselves, we will only experience our own bankruptcy. Again, like Peter, as we look into Jesus, we discover his faithfulness. And that reminds us of the first uh, chapters of our, our book by Lee Turner, How to Control Your Emotions. The key is the Christ-centered life and knowing our union with him. We have another illustration in this very full chapter, the story of Gideon who um, is called upon by God to deliver uh, Israel from the Midianites during the period of the judges. Gideon is so fearful, he's hiding, trying to thresh out some grain. What does the angel say? The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I imagine Gideon looks around, who are you talking to? But uh, in this famous story, God reduces the size of Gideon's army to a small band where uh, only God could give a supernatural victory and God could get the glory. And we see that the Gideon's warriors uh, broke their pitchers and had their torches raised, and the enemy, the Midianites, uh, fed in terror and turned on each other, and God gave them the victory. And our author says, we have this treasure of the Christ, the Christ life in us, in earthen vessels, the earthen vessel of our human body, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So like Gideon, friends, trust God to give us deliverance for his glory and uh, for our encouragement. And then finally, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'm so thankful, aren't you, uh, that in Romans chapter 8, we're told that it's the Holy Spirit living in us that is our source of confidence. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And uh, here in our chapter, we have reminders of our identity in Christ and how he is our source of security. Romans chapter 8, verse 
14 says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Aren't you thankful for that? That the Holy Spirit lives in you and me as true believers in Jesus Christ. And he has given us this privilege to say to, to God, Abba or Daddy. And in that intimate relationship, as we face our fears, as we go through anxiety, as we go through worries, they are invitations to discover his faithfulness and to exercise our faith that God is indeed faithful. Could I give you one more verse to add to your very full list in this chapter? I can't resist mentioning uh, one of my favorites, and that's Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Um, we have uh, a great memory verse here. Fear not, uh, God says to uh, the remnant who will be dispersed into captivity in Babylon. He's prophetically giving them this word of encouragement, and he gives it to you and me as well as believers. Fear not, God says, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isn't that amazing? So we have a word of correction. Don't, don't fear. Don't be dismayed. That's our natural tendency, right? Especially if you watch a lot of the news. But what is the consolation? God promises, I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What a great promise. What an encouragement for you and me to say, Lord, as I go through uh, these last days where um, the signs of the times give us many things to be worried and concerned about, sometimes afraid of, to, to have this as an opportunity to trust in you and discover that you can give us peace in the midst of the storm, uh, security in the midst of threatening circumstances for your glory. So friends, let's ask God's blessing as we apply these principles to our life. Shall we pray? Lord, we've covered a lot of ground in this Bible study on fear. And as we think of a topic that's mentioned over 450 times in your word, we know it's something that we all deal with. Lord, help us to understand the appropriate role of fear. But then, Lord, when fear goes beyond its bounds, when it's irrational, when it's excessive, when it robs us of our freedom, Lord, we ask that you would intervene. I pray for anyone watching this Bible study who is troubled by panic attacks, by fear, by anxiety that's robbing them of their freedom, that, Lord, you would take uh, the principles of this Bible study and remind us that Christ in us is greater than any fear we face. Greater are you who are in us, Lord, than the one who is in the world. So I pray, Lord, that we would uh, take refuge in these promises. Give us the grace to, to believe your word. Help us, as Peter walked on the water, to look unto you. And even when we're distracted by the wind and the waves, Lord, we know that your hand is right there to lift us up and to remind us to trust in you and to take one faith step at a time to demonstrate your faithfulness and your security in the midst of life's challenges. We love you, and we thank you for being our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. We ask your blessings with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.